Welcome back, everybody. Today, I am here to talk to you about the musical entitled Hamilton by Lin Manuel Miranda. I've become very interested in his work. I've been wanting to watch this musical for a very long time, and I was sad and not realizing like when is this going to even come out? You know, I had all these thoughts. I wanted to see it in person, but frankly, I didn't have the the money and or time to be doing so while it was, you know, premiering in in LA where I live. And um I had even thought of potentially flying out to New York just to watch it and and you know, maybe trying to get one of those gambling $10 tickets, but in the end I said forget it and I waited and I waited and you know, patience rewarded me by Disney Plus releasing the original cast, which I was so proud to be able to experience. And it was great on here. I'm sure the live experience is better. And, you know, in the future for things like this, I would I would like to experience it live. If I ever got to see the original cast or heck, even a redo live, I, I probably would do it. It's it's that good. I would watch it again. I, I recommend it. So my short answer is go watch Hamilton. I have a number of random points that I'm going to give you. I caught this little thing off uh, Amazon, which is a Hamilton notebook. And I take a lot of notes. I have an old yellow pad from when I was in law school that's almost about to run out from all the notes that I take about my many projects that I work on, and including my Bible study, including the books that I'm translating, audiobooks I'm working on, and then just random career-minded thoughts as well. In any event, I moved on to this Hamilton notebook recently, and here are my randomized notes in review of Hamilton, the musical. The first thing is I'm a black man, but I'm also not an ADOS. I'm not an African descendant of slaves. And so my experience with American history is different. Do I experience racism in the United States? Absolutely. And sometimes my experience of it may be, you know, uh, if not worse, m more instantiations, you know, and uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the systemic racism, whatever is going to happen, is going to happen to me. The cyclical racism within the systemic racism is what's not going to affect me. And, um, you know, it's a weird situation in Ethiopia. My parents had a relatively privileged background or else they wouldn't have been able to come here when they did. But when they came here, they were dirt poor and they had just the money in their pocket and you know they they worked hard they did the american dream they did all that stuff until they got to a point where they were well off and so i was raised in a more sanitized environment and well off but anyway it's a long rambling being a black man but not an ados person in studying american history i feel both shame and pride i feel an absolute pride as being an American, as being a person who was accepted into this country. Um, I mean, I was born here, but my parents were accepted in open arms and have been here for decades. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, it's a country that had certain values, freedom, inclusion, things like that. And I, I really appreciate that tradition. And if you look at the early founding fathers, you cannot ignore the specter of slavery, which I'll get to. But when you look at their writings, if you're a fan of the English language, or as H.L. Mencken referred to it, the American language, you have to respect the erudition of these men, and most of them were men. But if you respect their erudition, there's something that can be gleaned there. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You read it all, and you read it with a critical eye, with a critical lens. And you, you never forget the specter of slavery. You can't forget it. It's right there. It's the elephant in the room. But you have to also be able to look past it to see what erudition is there and to see what makes America unique. Because slavery is a phenomenon that was all over the world, and it was particularly horrendous in the United States. But we have to ask ourselves, is it the particularly horrendous nature of chattel slavery that led to America becoming the greatest nation on earth? I don't think so. And in many ways, America has produced both the most good and the most harm. Through the federal government, America has caused the most harm to the more places on earth than any other regime, I think, ever. And I think that is objectively true. I think it's specific. It's a specific claim that's also measurable. 
also though you have to look at all the things that we've produced and i'm not just talking about hollywood but you know technology film everything writing everything i mean we're producing the culture that spreads throughout the world so that has to be taken into account so the other part of that equation is that i also fuck with the people who turn the flag upside down who burn flags because I understand the anguish. I understand the sense of injustice. I understand the indignation, the righteous anger that is aflame. And so there's always the specter of slavery and everything else that was unjust, right? The lack of women's suffrage, every, everything that you can imagine in the founding of America. So it, there's both ugly and there's beauty. And so whenever you get into American history, I want you to understand that. There's this idea and I'll talk about it again later, of democratizing the humanities, of, of bringing knowledge that was in academe in the humanities departments to larger populations. And I saw this a few years ago, back in 2016, when I lived in North Dakota, I was in Grand Forks, and I think uh, Clay Jenkinson was in Bismarck or somewhere else in North Dakota. Anyway, through various networks, I found out about Clay Jenkinson, who cosplays as Jefferson. And he does a lot of these live performances. He stays in character. He had his own podcast. He even had, I think, an audio book that I listened to when I was a part of the 1776 Club for a while. And it was just absolutely fascinating, right? I was working as an organizational ombudsman, but also I was really like trying to learn. I was in the environment where knowledge is being disseminated from the university. And I said, gosh, there's so much here to learn. I got to keep learning myself, you know? So it, it, it uh, unleashed the curiosity that was in me. And I said, this is great, not only for me, who's, you know, had university education in Jefferson before, majored in political science as an undergraduate and is considering it for later graduate work, potentially even a PhD. And I said, wow, this is really great, even for the people maybe who've never had a college education, who are getting a chance to delve deeper into one of the founding fathers. And I've been a fan of the Tom Woods show, a libertarian podcast for a long time. Tom Woods has had a guest, Kevin Gutzman, on before. For a brief time, I was a member of this kind of alt university called Tom Woods uh, Classroom. And Kevin Gutzman and Tom Woods both often talk about and teach about Thomas Jefferson there. So I've learned about Thomas Jefferson there as well as the Tom Woods show. So in his in his classroom, as well as in the show itself, that's the free version on, on YouTube and Stitcher and all these other platforms. And so I've always been biased towards Jefferson amongst the founding fathers. Dan Carlin calls himself a Jeffersonian Democrat. If I had to identify it as something in the American context and in the Ethiopian context, it would change. But in the American context, I'd probably say I'm a black Jeffersonian Democrat or an Afro Jeffersonian Democrat, I throw the Afro, the black there to never forget Sally Hemings, to never forget a lot of the, the things that he could have done and didn't do, but to still acknowledge a lot of the greatness of his ideas, like getting rid of the standing military, like making things uh, more decentralized, like having people be more sustaining, people take long walks, people be able to be farmers and grow their own food and not rely so much you know, on, on currency, to be skeptical of a central bank or a national bank, things like that, right? Those great ideas. And anyway, that side was really fermented by Tom Woods, fermented by Tom Woods and Kevin Gutzman. But Tom Woods had a debate one time with Michael Malice and Curtis Yarvin also um, has opened me up to the other side, which is Hamilton. So Michael Malice is very Hamilton oriented. Curtis Yarvin, very Hamilton oriented. And they both, you know, they both like the way that he got stuff done as an executive. That's the function of him that they like and that he has a great come up story. So that's interesting. And then you enter Lin-Manuel Miranda who popularizes this uh, biography that he read one day by chance. And I grew up listening to musicals. In middle school and high school, I listened to Grease, Fiddler on the Roof, Hairspray, and I say listen, but also watched, uh, Grease, Fiddler on the Roof, Hairspray, and Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. And I loved all of them, right? So I'm, I'm into the genre of musicals. It's not something I, I always watch, but it's something that I'm into as an, an avenue. I think the way they say that sugar helps you 
swallow medicine i think the singing helps you swallow a story in an easier fashion and hamilton is is no short musical it's two hours and 40 minutes you get a little intercession but uh intermission rather but it's a long musical it's almost three hours so it's you know equivalent of almost if you buy just the audio version on, on itunes it's about half of a normal audiobook which is long especially you know i, I watched it in in one sitting so that's that's kind of long i also grew up on kadase or the liturgy of the ethiopian orthodox church and so the liturgy itself is this musical that tells the story of christ so i have the liturgy of the good is right i have grease fiddler on the roof hairspray joseph in the technicolor dream coat here's hamilton hamilton democratizes the humanities and by that i don't mean it gets people to vote on the humanities i mean uh, they're voting with their time, you could say, but I mean, instead of just focusing on reserving a musical or a uh, certain knowledge to the elites, the musical format allows it to reach a larger audience. Using people of color instead of uh, what the people actually were, I think people got their panties in a bunch around this idea. I think it was great. I think it was great that they used people of color it's obviously not those characters. It reminds me of the historical fiction that Gore Vidal is uh, known for. I actually have Gore Vidal's Burr book and his Lincoln book. And I started Burr, but I never finished it. But this musical, watching it, actually inspired me to go and watch Burr. Burr is a major character in this musical alongside Hamilton and Washington and Jefferson and Madison. So uh, anyway, you have people of color instead of the, the white people who these people actually were. That's okay. Sometimes historical fiction like Jeff Rickenbach says, is more important or stronger in, in knowledge giving than historical, like historicity, the whole historicity as a, a field in the 21st century. So you've got to be able to, to, I think, take everything not just with a grain of salt, but with a kilo of salt and understand that the author's presentation is more important than the genre. You know, you can have a great author writing something with quote unquote historicity, but it's highly subjective, right? It's got this narrative that you don't even know what's going on. And then you could have this historical fiction that has things in it that are obviously fiction, right? Like the ethnicity of the of the characters uh, who are playing another character, but maybe the certain points, they're, they're more accurate. And again, you could read uh, Kevin Gutzman's review on the subject. He reviewed it, I believe, in the American Conservative. And he, he has a few points that he has disagreements with regarding historicity. But overall, he gave it a rave review, and he's a Jefferson guy. So that's great. And then the other element of this musical is that it's very hip hop, but it's not exclusively hip hop. It's got more singing and jazz and R&B, rhythm and blues in there as well. So again, the singing, the, the R&B, the jazz, the hip hop, gets you to digest what otherwise might be to you stale history. And the POC or the people of color and the fictionalization aspect of that, rather than being overly historic, may be another way to get you, or, or if not you personally, people who would not otherwise try to go read up on Hamilton and all these other founding fathers, gets them interested in that original history, and maybe it draws them back to the primary sources. So now I'm still going to Burr, which is not a primary source, but I'm definitely looking at primary sources in addition to looking at historical fiction by Gore Vidal. So that's beautiful. Some people are elites who are just for elites. Some people uh, might claim to be masses for the masses, maybe in Bolivia and Ecuador. And other people are elites who claim to be for the masses, right? You think of this in Marxism in regards to the vanguard. Now, that culture of that latter answer of elites for the masses is definitely the culture and the milieu, the setting, the context in which I grow up. But I don't ever pretend to be the person who's the spokesman of the working class or the spokesman of the masses. I think that's dangerous. And I don't ever try to impose something on them. What I do is I try to share knowledge. I try to empower people who are in the masses. There's no getting around it. I'm an elitist. But I'm an elitist who doesn't just focus on being an elitist, but who spreads that knowledge, who shares that knowledge freely. It says in the Bible, freely you have been given. Uh, freely you have received, therefore freely give. That was the motto of my university, Pepperdine. It embodies the life of Jesus Christ, who, as we hear in Philippians, uh, had equality with God, but did not consider it something to be taken advantage of or grasped and held. And so instead emptied himself and took on the form of a slave and submitted unto death, not just death, but unto a shameful death, not to his loved ones, but to strangers 
and enemies. And so that's what I try to reflect in my life. Some of the themes in Hamilton. Hamilton is referred to in the songs as a bastard, an orphan, an immigrant. I love it. I love it. A bastard, an orphan, and an immigrant. When you think old white man on the $10 bill, do you think immigrant? Likely not, but they say he's from the Caribbean. Do you think that he was an orphan, right? Maybe you didn't know that about him. Did you think that he was a bastard? Maybe you thought he was super privileged. These things don't sound privileged. Now, relationally to the slaves, obviously he's privileged. But relationally to some of the other founding fathers, he's pretty disadvantaged. So if you like a come up story, here's a come up story. Uh, the the people say to him, uh, in uh, you know, uh, kind of tongue in cheek, that he's always writing like he's running out of time. I like that idea. He's prolific. I try to be prolific. Nipsey Hussle was prolific. Gary Vaynerchuk is prolific. I try to produce writing. I try to produce audio. I try to produce video as much as I can. And I think people who are driven by legacy do that, especially an intellectual legacy. So I really like that. Hamilton, uh, when he's talking about himself, says he's not trying to throw away his shot. So that's the kiros that we learn about, the heroes in ancient Greek or biblical Greek. It's an opportunity. You have one shot made famous in uh, Eminem's Eight Mile, but use the present. Do not delay. Act now. That's what I learned from this musical. It's use your opportunity. Do not throw away your shot. You don't know when you're going to get another one. So act in the moment. Don't be frozen by analysis paralysis. Act. Do. So another thing. Uh, that people say about him in the musical is that he will never be satisfied. He's a perfectionist. He's always striving for more and more. <coughs> Excuse me. He's always striving for more and more. He's always trying to get things done. He's always ascending the hierarchy, the dominance hierarchy. He's increasing within the stratified world. He's not debating whether the world should be stratified or not. He's not trying to... Um, debate people about what type of equalizing forces should be there. He's a man of action. He takes executive action. This is why Michael Malice likes him. This is why Curtis Yarvin likes him. I think Michael Malice more for the fact that he's an underdog who makes a rise up. I think Curtis Yarvin more for the kind of executive action that he takes. Um, there is the idea of the duel and its role in civilized society. Now, this is interesting. I think three times in the musical, you have people who do duels. Now, a duel is where you have your backs to each other, you walk 10 paces, uh, or you count to 10, something like that, and you, I think you have a one-shot pistol, and you try to shoot each other to the death. Now, within that, there are certain like civility processes where you can kind of call a truce. Um, it's kind of like a game of chicken to see if you're actually going to shoot each other or if you're going to call a truce. You can have peace negotiations beforehand to try to see if you can broker a deal. Sometimes you'll have an advocate on each side. You might have a third party neutral to mediate or arbitrate on your behalf. But what happens is, um, you know, ultimately people always have a chance of dying. And we live in a world today that we think is more civilized. We view the duel as something barbaric. But I would submit to you that the duel is more civilized than what we have today. You see people like Ghislaine Maxwell. And you see people like Jeffrey Epstein behind bars and people are openly joking and not just a few people like the masses on the internet are openly joking about how there's a secret cabal of people who would be ruined by the facts that come out by these two people. And they, they joke about people being suicided, about people having their, their deaths, their murders faked in public. And there are a lot of people who are doing it. And that's supposed to be more civilized. I don't know whether there's truth behind that or not. I, I imagine that there is. But wouldn't you much rather see Jeff Epstein or Ghislaine Maxwell? Obviously, you'd like to see them in court and uh, you know expose everybody. But wouldn't you rather see them duel somebody than somebody come in the, in the dark of night like a thief and, and just murder them and, and frame them and, and lie to you and, and all of these powerful people on, on TV never get checked? Wouldn't it be interesting if sometimes they got checked because honor or duty said that they had to go duel somebody. The example I give is, I think, UFC. It's a less extreme example. Let's say we take the guns out of it and we use hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
the UFC and other MMA organizations or Vale Tudo or No Holds Barred, they give people an opportunity to settle disputes, to settle matters in a civil way. It seems chaotic to people who don't know, but it's controlled chaos. There are rules, there's a referee, there are judges, there are salaries, everyone's watching. It's in the open, right? There's nothing that gets rid of corruption more than spotlight. So it's in the spotlight. Um, what we have with the globalists is real chaos. You know, They're in control of the world. They're acting behind closed doors. Nobody knows what the rules are. We aren't the refs. We aren't the judges. We don't know what their salaries are. Their salaries are hidden. Their salaries are suspicious. So I think whether you have just a hand-to-hand -hand combat version or a single-shot pistol version, bring back the duel. Let me be controversial. What I learned from Hamilton, the musical, bring back the duel. And finally, if this is too much of a conspiracy theory for you, I want you to realize some things that we learned from the musical, that there are conspiracy theories and then there are conspiracy facts. The Declaration of Independence was a conspiracy fact, American history. The Constitution of the United States was a conspiracy fact. Hamilton endorsing Jefferson who was his opponent for a long time over his longer opponent and adversary, Burr, uh, Aaron Burr, is a conspiracy fact. All of these things were done behind closed doors by a group of affluent, rich, powerful, uh, white men. And none of you and none of us were a part of it. And yet these things are central and integral in our lives. That's my Hamilton review. Go watch it on uh, Disney Plus or go cop the audio version on iTunes. And hopefully there'll be some other musicals that I'll review down the line. Maybe the Book of Mormon. I don't know where I can cop that. Someone let me know in the comments.